Hey everybody, Peter Zion here coming to you from Chile, Colorado. <laughs> and the news we have in the last few days is that uh, militants, Houthi militants <laughs> in Yemen are launching a combination of low-grade ballistic missiles and <laughs> drones of commercial shipping in the Red Sea. And that's led uh, the 10 major shipping companies of the world to basically suspend operations in that area and either tell their ships to <laughs> wait uh, at the openings to the Red Sea until the threat passes or simply sail around uh, the Red Sea completely, which means going all the way around Africa for the Asia-Europe run. Now, first, let's get the caveats out of the way. Uh, this is not a state making a determined effort to shut down shipping in the area. Um, that is something that has happened before in the aftermath of the 1973 war between the Arab states and Israel. The Israelis found themselves occupying the eastern side of the Suez Canal, and so they did just that. Uh, in order to destroy one of Egypt's main sources of foreign currency and force them to the negotiating table. <laughs> That's not what it's at play here. We have basically a bunch of drug-addled militants, some of the world's least competent ones, operating from some of the world's least valuable land in Yemen, probably at the instigation of the Iranians, who are their primary supporter, because this is a little conflict that is a needle in the side of Saudi Arabia. Costs them very little to do it. They're using some of the same weapon systems that they're selling to the Russians. And it's plausible deniability. Uh, it just causes a lot of heartburn. So this is not a formal shutting down of trade. This is more of a heavy annoyance that has the opportunity to maybe get worse. But at the moment, uh, the warheads in play here are, you know, no more than a few two pounds to a few dozen pounds each. Nothing that can take out a tanker. Nothing that can take out a container ship. Uh, the reason everyone's so touchy about it is the way insurance law works on the seas is if you sail into a zone where someone is shooting a commercial shipping, your insurance policy is null and void. And so if anything happens, like you need a tow, you're on your own. Or God forbid that you actually get a leak either from the attack or from something else. You're on your own. So out of an abundance of caution, everyone's just avoiding the area altogether. Now, who gets affected by this? Uh, three big things to keep an eye on. First of all, uh, this is roughly... 30% of all global containerized traffic, and the biggest single chunk of that is Chinese exports to the European Union. Uh, these routes now need to go around the bulk of the African continent, which, based on uh, where this stuff is being sold to, increases the sailing distance by one-third to two-thirds, and that means you need one-third to two-thirds more container ships to maintain the same flows. So we're going to see a lot of pinches in the supply chains for finished goods. <laughs> These aren't intermediate products for the most part. These are finished goods uh, coming from the Chinese, which is obviously going to hit their bottom line in an environment where consumption is basically seized up in China and all they have left are exports. Uh, it's also going to make it a little bit easier for the Europeans to put trade sanctions on the Chinese for product dumping, for example, in the EV space. Uh, the Europeans are always looking for protectionist <laughs> Uh, methods to apply. And if the Chinese are proving <laughs> unreliable in their deliveries, that'll make that case that much easier. The second thing is crude oil coming from the Persian Gulf, mostly Saudi crude, that is going uh, then north through the Red Sea and Suez. There are a couple of bypass pipelines for Suez that go through Egypt as well, um, which go into the Mediterranean basin and of course Europe. Uh, in the aftermath of the Ukraine war, this route has gotten a lot more traffic because the Europeans are no longer taking Russian crude. So the Persian Gulf has stepped in. This is about 12% of global energy shipments. Now, if this proves to be any more than a momentary problem, uh, what the Europeans are going to be forced to do, what the Saudis are going to be forced to do, is to do what happened the last time this was closed down in 1973. Uh, the super tanker was developed. The traditional oil tanker only carries about 500,000 barrels, whereas a super tanker can carry a little bit over 2 million uh, it takes a larger tanker to make the trip all the way around Africa economically viable. And of course, the Saudis know a few people who have super tankers. Uh, <coughs> so expect to see larger and larger vessels plying this route, which is going to put pressure on anyone else who is trying to bring in crude from a longer distance, which brings us to the third problem and where we're probably going to see the most pain in the market. And that's Russian crude exports. Now, when the Ukraine war started, the Europeans basically stopped using Russian crude, and then they gobbled up all of the crude that was available within arm's reach, some from the United States shale fields, some from North Africa, some from West Africa, and the rest from the Persian Gulf. That meant, because of a lack of infrastructure, Russian crude had to be exported through the same port points on the Black and the Baltic Sea, but it had to be then shipped 
through the Mediterranean, through Suez, through the Red Sea, across the Arabian Sea to India, Southeast Asia, and China. Well, that is barely an economically viable route now, which is one of the reasons why the Russians are typically selling their crude at a 20 to a $30 a barrel discount. But if Suez is closed, then they can no longer send these small tankers through it. And these small tankers don't have the reach to go all the way around Africa in addition to all the way around Asia. So you're looking at something like 1.5 to 2 million barrels a day of Russian crude that might finally actually be stranded if this isn't solved pretty quickly. Now, the Russians <coughs> do have one thing going for them here. Uh, the insurance rules that I kind of laid out there are how insurance has been working since the 1980s. But since the Ukraine war has started and Western insurers have been bypassing Russian ships completely, you have some Russian players, some Indian players, and some Chinese players who have started to offer indemnification insurance. So we might get this really colorful situation where the real shipping companies stop using Suez and the Red Sea, but these shadow companies that have never had to pay out start using it, and then we get to find out what happens if an Iranian-backed militant force hits a Chinese Indian or Russian ship and how it goes down there. So this is an interesting little story. This is not the panic in shipping uh, that I'm anticipating because there's no real sovereign behind it. No one's actually trying to break the shipping routes, but it does raise some interesting mixes of motivations that are probably going to shake out in the next week or two. So stay tuned. I know I'll be watching. Bye.